Hello and welcome to The Wolf's Den. I'm Dave here with Mary Ellen. And today we are going to be talking about A Game of Thrones, Catalan 3. Indeed. So uh, to get things started, I'll just kind of uh, give everybody an idea of where it begins. Uh, it starts um, with Ned and the girls being eight days gone. Uh, Maester Lewin comes into Bran's sick room. Uh, he's carrying a reading lamp and the books of account. And he says to her basically that it is time that we review the figures and figure out uh, some of the things that we're going to do around here as well. Because uh, a lot of the people that work around here have left and we need to refill those positions. And, and basically he's there for business. He had, seems like he had tried to put off going there because of her grief, but he can no longer do that. No, because they have like several important positions that are currently unfilled. Correct. They don't have a head of security at the castle anymore. They don't have a steward who keeps track of all of their stuff. And she's not doing her job. So basically the castle is in complete disarray. And Rob is like running around like a chicken with his head cut off. Trying to do like 57 jobs. Because Catalan refuses to do what she's supposed to be doing. Kind Ab of. Absolutely. Now... To her credit, I was like, a lot of people would be losing their minds if one of their kids was almost dying. In a coma like that, yeah. Yes, so it's not like the most insane thing no. that she is... Beside herself with grief. Yes, that's the that's the term I was looking for. But, as we'll kind of expand but on... But he's like, I get that, but I still need to come here and do this. But we still have to do this. She doesn't care and tells him that she doesn't care. Um... I know what this visit has cost us. And she looks at Bran. And um, she's like, tell the steward to do it. And he's like, we don't have a steward. Right. We don't have a steward. So I can't tell a steward to do it because you have to appoint a steward. So then I can tell the steward to do it. But as of right now, we don't have a steward. So I basically need you to do your job, is what he's saying. Uh... Then Cal's like, oh, yes, I remember. We don't have a steward. Still doesn't really care, though. Maester Lewin then sets his thing, his things down. He's like, there are actually several appointments that require your immediate attention. We also don't have a captain of the guards to fill Jory's place, a new master of horse. And then Catelyn just goes berserko. You think I care about horses? I'll kill mm -hmm. all the horses if it would make Bran open his eyes and all this other stuff. Right, it's very dramatic. Yes, also, still not completely blaming her, but it's been days, and she pretending that she has to sit right next to him, and she can't even have this conversation while sitting in the room with him is a little bit much. Of course, it's a, it's a little dramatic. It it's not like Maester Lewin actually came to you, so you wouldn't have to leave Bran's side, and they could take care of business. Yeah, absolutely. So what he was doing was not really unacceptable in any way, shape, or form. No, it's not. He's like, this stuff needs to be done. I need you to do it. Please help me out here. And then he says, yes, my lady, but the appointments, and then he's cut off. I'll make the appointments, Rob said. So Catalan had not heard him enter, and neither did we until he kind of chimed in. Yes. So he's in the doorway now, so there's three people in the scene now. You've got Catalan, Lewin, well, four. Bran in bed, Catelyn, Lewin, and now Rob. Um, and at that point, I think she even realizes, like, maybe she's not acting quite normal. Um, she had been shouting, she realized, with a sudden flush of shame. What was happening to her? She was so tired and her head hurt all the time. Now, to add to the grief part, it seems as though she hasn't been sleeping. Hadn't been sleeping. No, so she actually she, discusses this with Rob. She goes, I can't sleep. What if Bran needs me? Right. And you're like, but what do you mean? Like, you guys have servants and stuff here. If you want to sleep, then sleep. And order and them ha and to have wake somebody you up wake you up immediately if he needs something. This this isn't... Or if there's a development, if he move like anything. If his hand moves, wake me up. If he coughs... Wake me up. If he does anything... If his eyes like, flutter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Basically, if anything happens, wake me up. But you could and should be sleeping. It's not helping her cause here. 
Lewin then chimes in and says that he prepared a list of those they might consider. Because he, I think he anticipated that she wouldn't be in the mood. Yes. So he came prepared with, all right, but just approve. Look at this list, and if you approve, we'll just move forward with this. Yeah. He basically did it for her. Yes. And he's like, I just need you to say that I, I can't. I'm just your maester. I can't appoint people. People to but I know offices. everybody here, and these are the people that I think are best suited for the vacant positions. And Rob looked at him and was like, this is a pretty good list. I, I like what you did here. Okay, yeah. Um, then Rob's like, all right, Mr. Lewin, get out of here. Yeah, I, leave us. I need, I need to talk to my mother for a second. And uh, She notices he's wearing a sword, and he says, Mother, what are you doing? And Catalan thinks that she had thought Rob had always looked like her. But in this moment, uh, she saw something of Eddard Stark in his face. Something as stern and hard as the North. She's like, what am I doing? How could you ask that? What do you imagine I'm doing? I'm taking care of Bran. I'm taking care of your brother. I'm taking care of Bran. And then Rob goes, is that what you call it? <laughs> <laughs> is that what you call what you're doing? Right. You're not taking care of Bran. You're just acting insane and sitting in his room. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're actually doing is just acting insane and sitting in Bran's room. You can call it taking care of Bran, but actually Maester Lewin's the one taking care of Bran. You're really not doing much. Absolutely. Um, so let's get real here. Right. You're, you're not helping anything. You're just driving everyone nuts. And he starts telling her, he's like, we also need you around here. Rickon, in particular, needs you. He doesn't know what's going on. He's three. He thinks everyone abandoned him. He's following me around. He's crying. He has absolutely no idea what's going on. You have completely abandoned your three-year-old. Mm -hmm. Rob is like trying to say it as nicely as possible, but he's like, I don't know what to do with him. Mm -hmm. I'm 14. Right. I have no clue what to do with him. He's three, and he's flipping out, and you haven't even looked at him once as far as we can tell. Since Bran fell. And that was before they left. Eight days ago. <clears throat> she didn't say goodbye to any of the people. Well, she wouldn't go to the gate. She allegedly, some of them, said she said her goodbyes to some of them. At least according to her. According to her brain. She her said, insomniac brain at this moment. She said she goodbye said to She said goodbye to people. But Rob seemed pretty disturbed. He is under the impression that she didn't say goodbye to any of them. Yes. Uh, he says the only three. And then... Something that's probably pretty hard for him, being that he has to feel that he needs to fill a man's shoes now. He swallows his own pride and says, and not only does Rickon need you, but I need you. I'm trying, but I can't. I can't do it all by myself. And his voice breaks with emotion. He's like, I'm 14 and I'm trying to run the North. You were supposed to be helping me. Mm -hmm, absolutely. But I am currently attempting as a 14-year-old with no advisor basically except for Maester Lewin trying to help me out run the north as a 14 year old you were supposed to be the one doing a lot of this stuff with me but you're not doing any of it and she wanted to go to him but couldn't because she was holding Bran's hand which is just I don't even know what that means to be honest what was she's Bran very out of it what was Bran gonna do leave if she let go of his hand for a second and went over to her firstborn son who needs her also needs her in this moment she couldn't because she was holding Bran's hand go and comfort Rob and help Rob out this often is something that goes on with her she wanted she wants to do something or thinks she should do something but, but then just like doesn't but doesn't do it uh, Outside the tower, a wolf began to howl. Catalan trembled just for a second. Rob tells her it's Bran's. And he opens the, the window and to bring in the night air into the stuffy tower room. Uh, don't, she told him. Bran needs to stay warm. And uh, Rob tells her that he needs to hear the, the wolves. Yes. So Rob seems to be... This is a kind of a clue, I think. That Rob already understands that there's a, a very special bond between them and their wolves. Rob might not be able to articulate what this bond is yet, but he understands that these wolves and them belong together. Mm -hmm. 
and Bran is needs to be able to hear his wolf. Yes. So, um, let's see here. So it says here, uh, Catelyn was shaking. It was the grief, the cold, the howling of the dire wolves. Oh, something interesting too. Rob could tell the difference between the, the wolves. Uh, Shaggy Dog and Grey Wind chime in and he goes, you can tell them apart if you listen close. I just thought that was kind of interesting. Um, night after night, the howling and the cold wind and the gray empty castle. On and on they went, never changing, and her boy lying there, broken, the sweetest of her children, the gentlest. Bran, who loved to laugh and climb and dream of knighthood, all gone now. She could hear, she would never hear him laugh again. There's an annotation here that's interesting because it speaks to uh, George R. R. Martin's style of writing. Uh, and I'll just read it. I just think it's interesting. The Ice and Fire novels are written in close third person, and this is one of the places where the stylistic possibilities this technique provides becomes clearest. This run-on sentence with its many clauses shines a light on Catalan's frantic, exhausted mental state. Basically, she's acting deranged. Yes. <clears throat> and uh, when you're in their head, this third person... It's almost hard to follow what the heck is even going on in her head because she is acting nuts. Yes. It's and as a, as a woman, I'm not saying exactly something like this has happened, but it's not uncommon for, especially she's fatigued and, and the trauma of this whole thing has set her mind like on fire. If you've ever been awake for too long, you'll understand that your brain starts going a little bit wild. It does, absolutely. Even like the hysterical laughter that's going to come later. The hysterical laughter sometimes can come from exhaustion. Oh, yeah. Um, so she sobs, she starts crying, and she pulls her hand free of Bran's and covered her ears against those terrible howls. Make them stop, she cried. I can't stand it. Make them stop. Make them stop. Kill them all if you must. Just make them stop. And then she falls to the floor. Rob lifts her up and hold, holds her in his strong arms. Don't be afraid, mother. They would never hurt him. Uh, he tells her that basically you need to rest. Like, like, this is your manic at this point. You are acting full-fledged insane. You need sleep. The only thing that's going to make you act normal again and feel better is sleep. And that's true. Human beings cannot go. You, you can't go. She's been awake for like almost two weeks. You can't do that. Apparently. I, I, I doubt that she's actually been awake for two weeks, but she hasn't been sleeping very much. No. Right, right. But she needs, like, good rest. So that's basically what he says. She says, I can't. God's forgive me. I can't. What if he dies while I'm asleep? What if he dies? Um, oh, God's closed the window. And he says, all right, fine. I'll close the window. If you swear to me, you'll sleep. And then as he is about to go, he goes over to the windows. He hears dogs. And he's like, that's weird. I've never heard all the dogs bark like that before. Yes. And then he sees, oh, that, and then he says there's a fire. And then here's Catelyn just going berserko again. She's like, we need to, Bran, help me, help me. And <clears throat> Rob ignores her and goes, the library tower's on fire. And then Catelyn goes, thank the gods. Out loud, she whispered. Rob looked at her if she, as if she'd gone mad. Because he goes, there's a fire, and he's frantic in, in what she says he's out thinking, loud. He's I have to do something about this fire. That's what he's thinking about. Holy shit, there, now something's on fire. And But he doesn't hear the inner monologue. He just says, this is what Rob's perspective is. He says, the library tower's on fire. And she says, thank the gods. Well, first she says, help me. Help me with Bran. And then he goes, the library no, tower's no, on right. fire. No, no, right. This is the order it goes. He says, the library tower's on fire. Then she has this crazy, like, inner thing. But the only thing he hears is, thank the gods. And at that point, he's like... All right. He, didn't, he doesn't know that she thought, oh, good, at least Bran's safe. He just hears, thank the gods. So like, he's like... All right, whatever. You what, stay here. I'm going to go take care of yes, this. Yes, yes. <laughs> because from his perspective, he didn't know what she was saying thank the gods to. He's like, all right. Do you just... <laughs> All right, I'm going to go because I have to go deal with this. You, yes. You just stay here, I guess, and stay out of our way mm -hmm. or whatever. Stay, Keep taking care of Bran if that's what you're calling. Whatever, you're but I, I got to go. I have to go. And then she hears, 
shouts of fire, fire, fire. She said a silent prayer <laughs> of thanks to the seven faces of God for reasons we don't understand again. That the library's on fire, apparently, that's 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 great. And then she feels bad about all the books mm-hmm. that the Starks had accumulated over millennia that are probably burning right now. At least she thought that. She's like, man. Oh, man, all those books are She's like, gone. the Starks have been collecting knowledge for like 10,000 years in that, or 8,000 years in that library, and it's all on fire now. Great. Which was a, a very uh, convenient diversion for Littlefinger if he's a bad guy. I certainly think that this guy is his cat's paw that's there. Mm-hmm. And he told them to burn the Winterfell line. We know that Joffrey sent the cat's paw. It's not, it can't be disputed. But. But that doesn't mean that that's not Littlefinger's dude that Joffrey used as the cat's paw. He, who chose to burn, he could have lit anything on fire. To make a diversion. He, he, he chose the place with all this. He burned 8,000 years worth of knowledge. Correct. Especially knowledge. Because what we do know, because Tyrion tells us, is that when Baylor the Blessed said burn everything, the Starks said, oh, that was nice. That's cute. Yeah. They basically said, oh, that's cute. Because there were no more dragons at that point. Yeah, what are you going to do? You can't even get up here. You can't even get past Mo Kalen. You can't even walk. And that guy couldn't even walk. That guy's yeah. not doing anything. You're, you're not doing anything. They couldn't enforce it. Yeah. So that what they did is not burn any of the 8,000 years worth of knowledge. They took the parchment and, like, burned it and moved on. Yeah. They actually, <laughs> what they burned was the letter. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. That's them. what I meant. The parchment yeah. that the letter was written on. Yeah. They, they burned the letter. <laughs> and not, then they went the, and ate. Not the stuff that they went and ate dinner. Burn. Yeah. No, and they moved on with their day. Yeah. Um, so that's gone. With the exception of the couple of books that Tyrion borrowed from them. Which I feel like might be significant. Like, he got a couple of really good nuggets like from that collection. Really important books about dragons that are have been saved. Somehow, miraculously, because, by Tyrion. Because Tyrion had never seen completed copies of these in his entire life because Baylor the Blessed burned the rest of them. In the, the Starks, The Starks, in his opinion, had the... Especially that one thing that he didn't take with him that when he, in his first chapter, was like, I'm pretty sure that is the only surviving copy of that book in the entire world. Remember when he was telling the, the Septon to be really, gone. to be really careful with that? Yeah, because when I'm he was pretty sleeping, sure, kind of, he was like half in and he's out. Like, he's like, be really careful with that. I think that's the only surviving copy of that in the entire world. Wow, and that's all gone. Gone. Burned. Anyways, let's keep moving. Um, so it's mayhem in the in the Bailey below, and then the man shows up. When she turned away from the window, the man was in the room with her. Not a man, but the man, yeah, which is very like very weird. Another weird thing. You're like, huh? Because that the way it's phrased almost implies that she knew that somebody was there. Yes. Just like the knock is different than then there was a knock, then there was the knock. It that's should have been. Different. And when she turned around, a man was in the room with her. And. She also never does the, confuses the word a and the again, as far as I know. No, she doesn't. It only happens in these two very strange circumstances early on. In two consecutive Catalan chapters, she misuses the word a and the. Mm-hmm. But, so did she know there was a guy? Is she Like, so, so delirious that she's Then the man was stuff. there. Right, yeah. Um, so he's disgusting. She fights him off. Yes. We don't need to get into the details of her fighting him off. She does a good job. We're going to give her a round of applause. Yeah, absolutely. She fought like she any mother him. should. Yeah. If someone's going to try to kill their kid, she's fighting with everything she's got. She bit a chunk of his hand off. Yeah. And then Summer doesn't have a name yet, but we're going to call him Summer anyways. Yes. Summer shows up and rips the guy's throat out. Yeah, absolutely. And basically, she... Starts laughing hysterically. When it's all done. And that's how they find her. Just with the dog or the wolf comes over, cleans up her hands a little bit, and she just starts laughing hysterically. Mm-hmm. And that is how they found her. However long later it was when they showed up because they had to go put that fire out and then come back. So when they came back after putting the fire out, she was still laughing hysterically. 
So that is who knows how long that was because I mean, they could, had to it put it out. It could have been twenty five or thirty minutes of consecutive hysterical laughing that she was yeah. doing there. Because you once they even got it out, then they were probably given instructions. All right, what are we going to do? We got to clean this up, you know. So, yeah. It was probably a while before someone yeah. walked back into that room. And plus they assume she's just sitting there anyway with him. Yes. You know, we don't, what do we need to rush back up there for? They weren't in a hurry to go back up there. No. She's been doing the same thing. There was an emergency where they were standing. They didn't know there was another emergency someplace else. So they wouldn't have rushed back up there. You're right. Which gets back to, would this have happened if Catalan would have listened to Maester Lewin? Probably, this I would imagine wasn't his first attempt at trying to get... Right, things they were so have head, unattended. They didn't have a head of security, and they didn't have anyone watching the stables. The guy was hiding in the stables, and there was a lapse in security. Lewin even brings up the horse. The horse. There was no one watching in charge of the stables. So this guy was just lurking there. This guy was lurking in the stables, and then the ma- the head of security was not appointed. They didn't have a head of security. So this is a problem. And here's why. Here's the direct result. here's the direct result of her dereliction of duty, if you will. Yeah. Is that an assassin was hiding in the stables where if you had appointed a new person to be in charge of the stables, they would have found him. Mm Mm-hmm. And you had a security breach where if you had a head of security, that probably wouldn't have happened. Absolutely. These two things happened in the exact areas where you needed new appointments. That he brings up earlier in the chapter. Yes. She never even thinks that, like, wow. If we had, if I had done my job... No, never, this never. This couldn't have happened. Mm-mm. But, regardless of that fact... It's a great point. Let's, uh... When the laughter finally died in her throat, they wrapped her up in warm blankets. Old Nan undressed her and gave her a bath. Old, uh, Lewin, uh, dresses her wounds... Uh, Gives her some milk of the pot because he's like, this is just the beginning of how bad this is going to hurt. And then she closes her eyes. And when she wakes up, they told her she had slept for four days. It all seemed like a nightmare to her now. Everything since Bran's fall. A terrible dream of blood and grief. But she had the pain in her hands to remind her that it was real. She felt weak and lightheaded, yet strangely resolute, as if a great weight had lifted from her. She asks for some food, uh, and that she wants Maester Lewin to attend to her bandages. Um, she remembers the way she had been before, and she felt ashamed. She had let them all down. Her children, her husband, her house. It would not happen again. All right, so th- I would say that's the most I've ever seen her be actively reflective on things. It's actually, I was going to say, the last time that she's ever self-reflective. Like, where she's like, what have I been doing? Like, a lot of that could have been avoided. She sort of does it one time when she finds out Ned is dead, and she's like, if I hadn't convinced him to take a job he didn't want to do, he'd probably still be alive. Mm Mm-hmm. But those, I think, are the only two times that she ever reflects on what she does. Ever. Well, we're going to mark this down as the one, and then we'll see if we can count any others under there. All right. Rob arrived before her food. Roderick Cassell came with him and her husband's ward, Theon Greyjoy. And lastly, Helen Mullen, a muscular guardsman with a square brown beard. And he had become the new captain of the guard, Rob told her. Her son was dressed like a, you know, a northern knight. I don't have knights, but he's in And this is actually when he's wearing the sword for the first time. While she was sleeping, Roderick gave him a sword. Because this is where she makes note of the fact that he was wearing a sword now. Okay, go on. Um, she asks who the guy was, and they're like, no, no one has a clue where he is, uh, who he was. We're pretty sure he was in the stables. You could smell it on him. And then she's like, well, how could this have gone unnoticed? And Hallis Mullen looked abashed. Mm. It seems likely that he, he wanted to say there was no sec- head of security and no one was in charge of the stables, but instead... He went very diplomatically. Not to be a picayune, he was wearing a sword earlier. Oh, my bad. I apologize. No, I I just... I'm like, am I imagining things? Um, Because she brings it up this time as though it was something new. Well, Um, to her and her fractured mind at this point. She doesn't even remember that he was wearing a sword last time. Exactly. All right. My bad. I apologize. But yes, Hallis Mullen's reaction was kind of like... Was uh, like, uh... 
And then he goes, well, between the horses that Lord Eddard took south and those that we sent north to the Night's Watch, the stalls were half empty. It was no great trick for him to hide from the stable boys. Could be that Hodor saw him. Saw him. Saw him. Uh, <laughs> talk is the boy's been acting queer, but simple as he is. Blah, blah, dot, dot, dot. He shook his head. We found where he was sleeping. He had 90 silver stags in a leather bag buried beneath the straw. This is Rob speaking up here. And then she's happy that her son's life wasn't sold cheaply. You would think it would cost more than 90 silver stags to kill Lord Eddard Stark's Hand of the King's son. It's a big risk that you're taking. But if he's a simpleton? True. You can get simple people. Who have never seen that much money in their whole life. Yeah, yeah so. you can. You really can. All right. And then Hallis Mullen looked at her confused. Begging your grace, milady, you saying he was out to kill your boy? Greyjoy was doubtful. That's madness. He came for Bran, Catelyn said. He kept muttering how I wasn't supposed to be there. He set the library fire, thinking I would rush to put it out, taking any guards with me. If I hadn't been half mad with grief, it would have worked. Um, why would anyone want to kill Bran, Rob said. He's only a little boy. Catalan gives him a challenging look. If you were to rule in the North, you must think these things through, Rob. Answer your own question. Why would anyone want to kill a sleeping child? Uh, the servants come back, blah, blah, blah. And then she asks how, how Bran's doing, and he tells, and Maester Lewin says unchanged. And then Rob steps up and is like, someone's clearly afraid that Bran might wake up. Mm -hmm. Afraid of what he might say, or afraid of something that he knows. And then Catalan makes everyone swear secrecy which I just find to be the most egregious <laughs> thing ever she sits here with the people who are sworn to house Stark that if they ever speak a word of what she's about to say about how they suspect the Lannisters and blah 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 from the letter from her sister and, and what have you and then she goes to King's Landing and literally tells Varys and Littlefinger yes Everything that she just swore to those, made those guys swear they would never utter a word of it to anybody. And then she goes and tells the least trustworthy two people in King's Landing <laughs> every single thing that she made everyone else swear oaths of secrecy about. Yeah, it's a big, she, this is a big deal. She makes them all swear. You have my oath. Each of them, she makes she them say it. She went one after another and made them swear yes. oaths of secrecy that they would never utter a word about what she's about to say. And then she goes to King's Landing and tells every sing and tells the two worst people that you could possibly tell everything she just made everyone else swear secrecy. About. So this is what she tells them. My sister Liza believes the Lannisters murdered her husband, Lord Aaron, the Hand of the King. It comes to me that Jamie Lannister did not join the hunt the day Bran fell. He remained here in the castle. I do not think Bran fell from that tower. I think he was thrown. Now, does she tell them all of that? But then it keeps going with the conversation. I think Jamie was the person who did it, I think. Does she tell that to Varys and Littlefinger? They're there to prove that the Lannisters are behind it and the dagger is the proof. That's, I mean, she doesn't tell them verbatim every single word of this okay. conversation, but she tells them all of the important pieces. Okay. So, yes, I mean, she basically swears these people to secrecy and then tells... Even anything. I think even telling anything to them was dumb. Was the stupidest thing ever. Any piece of this. Even in her mind, right before she tells them, she says... I trust Littlefinger very little and Varys not at all, and then tells them everything <laughs> they need, That uh, then just tells them everything. Actually, we don't exactly, I don't even think, no, I think that it just is like a single sentence and then she tells them the story. So right. we don't even know what, what she, she shared them. exactly. No, it, we don't. It, it's like, so, it, it is just egregious in my mind that she swears them to secrecy, to secrecy and then literally goes to King's Landing and tells them everything. So she has a theory that Jamie threw him out the window, and you know what? <laughs> it's not a bad theory. Because we know it's right. That happens to be correct. So I'll say she wasn't dumb. She thought about it. This is why I think that she could be a villain, because she always thinks of things and then comes to the right conclusion. The, no, she And then used... does the exact opposite. It, it, it's Catelyn in a nutshell. Think it through. 
come to the right conclusion, and then immediately do the exact opposite. Now, in this case, she's not doing the opposite, but she does figure this out. Yes. That well, Bran was thrown. Well, she was smart enough to know that we should never tell anybody this other than our right, stark but then she people, does, right. and then she goes and tells other people about it. So uh, Rob, being young, even though he's raised by Ned, is like blown away. But he's mad. And now he's mad, and I'm going to kill him myself if this is true and all yes. this stuff. Roderick yells at him. He's like, put your sword away, yeah, you like, freaking idiot. Yeah, yeah. They're a thousand <clears throat> miles away. What are you doing? And then all of a sudden, Rob looks like a little boy again. He puts his sword away. He's like, yeah, that's my bad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's like, you don't just start whipping that out in random rooms, what, like in front of ladies. What, and what, like, the hell like, are you, what the hell are you doing? Right. It's basically what Roderick said to him. And then she's like, we need to get proof. Because Maester Lewin's like, what we have is a bunch of conjecture. We have no proof of any Absolutely. of this. And if we're going to accuse the Queen's brother of something like this, we better have some proof when we do it. Definitely. Roderick goes, the proof is in that dagger. I don't know if you noticed it, but that's way too nice of a weapon. Whoever's dagger that was is the person who hired him, I would be willing to bet. Basically is what, Rob, is what Roderick says. And then she's sitting there, and they're like, we need to send somebody to King's Landing... Mm-hmm. And then, out of absolutely nowhere, for some reason, Catelyn decides that she's the person who needs to go. And I think it's interesting. The The author's annotation on it is that George realized that Catelyn was the character that he needed to send. Mm-hmm. And my guess is this is the moment where he decided that Catelyn was going to be the wrecking ball. I'll he might not end. have even decided that she was going to be the wrecking ball yet, but this is the moment when he was got to this point where he realized he was going to use Catalan as the catalyst. As the catalyst for the whole story. So it says here, Martin has indicated that this particular turn of the story was not something he had initially planned, and that it was in the moment of writing that he realized that Catalan was the only character who could realistically take the journey to King's Landing. Now, obviously, it's not realistically, you could have sent any of those people. But realistically means who would have the power to cause all of the problems that I need to have caused? Catelyn could do it. She could have Tywin Lannister take revenge on the Riverlands. Yes, she could, yes, like, yes. For the whole plot to develop the way that he wanted it to She's the only go. one that will have any agency. The rest of them will go, deliver the message, and then return. So realistically, you can't use any of them as a catalyst to make a to whole other, bunch of to other make stuff other happen. things happen because Roger Cassell would literally just go there, tell Ned, and then leave. Even yes. Theon, at this point in the story, He's, would have gone there, told Ned, and then left. Yes. So she's the only one that would have felt like they had agency to start doing other things. And then this is where it gets even weirder. This after this is where she discusses the need to get there before them. <laughs> To beat the Lannisters and the royal party back to King's Landing, which I don't understand why that's Lewin's necessary. Lewin's like, what? Is that wise, my lady? Everyone in the room thinks it's the dumbest thing ever. Surely the Lannisters would greet your arrival with suspicion? Yep. Then, and then, she, and then Rob's like, wait a minute, I'm confused. What about Bran now? We're done with the Bran thing? We're done with Bran now? We're done with the Bran thing? Like, I don't... You can't mean to leave him. Like, I just meant leave his room. I didn't mean, like, leave. Abandon him. Completely. Like you have with Rickon. Is, it's not even clear if if Rickon and his mother ever saw each other after, again, after Bran fell. Yeah. It is unclear as to whether or not she ever even uttered a word to her three-year-old after Bran fell. Right. It actually seems like she didn't. So she, so Rob said, you need to leave this room and, you know, get some rest and walk around and get some food and pay attention to Rickon. And she took that and goes, all right, I'm leaving. And then she tried to go by herself. She didn't want yeah. anyone to go with her. And then eventually Roderick's like, no, you're not going by yourself. You only need an escort. I'm going with you. At the very least, you need me to come with you. And, but she says. We're not taking the King's Road. Road. He hated sailing. So, so they, they took, took a boat. boat. And then... I'll let you read the last line. It's like, we'll follow the White Knife down to the sea, hire a ship at King, uh, White Harbor, strong horses, and brisk winds should bring us to King's Landing well ahead of Ned and the Lannisters. Reiterating and then, that again. this is the thing that I find very interesting. If you guys are, own the, auto, the uh, audiobooks, the way Roy Detrice reads this last sentence, 
he changes to a straight up villain voice. So he's like, we should be well ahead of the Lannisters. And she says this out loud to everybody. No. Yes, this is all inside the quotes. But then the last line is in her. And then we get a, a, and then the quote ends. She's not saying this out loud loud anymore. No, she's just in her head. And he transitions into this really dark, dark voice and goes, and then she thought, we shall see what we shall see. And he gets like, you couldn't have given him... That's like Roy DeTrice's best villain voice. Yes, it is. It is. I listen it's to the, it. It's the only sentence in the entire chapter that he reads like that. But he transitions into a straight-up villain voice. Maybe something snaps in her in this chapter, which, honestly, given the sleep thing and then what happened, and maybe she snapped. I mean, she was showing signs of potential insanity prior to getting attacked. And then what she does from here on out could only be determined as virtually insane. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, so... Because Catelyn is intelligent. Yeah, we've gone over this like a thousand times. I'm just Catelyn gonna reiterate is it very with smart. With this figuring out the Jamie thing. Yeah. No one else figured that out. No. She figured it out. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure Jamie didn't go that day. And I think he was thrown. I think Bran was thrown. Bran's been climbing all over everything for his entire life and he's never fallen before. So I think he was thrown. That's not unreasonable for her to think that. Mm-hmm. What is unreasonable is everything that comes Is out. every single thing that she does from here on out. So, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Yeah, me too. We pretty much love hating on Catelyn, as you guys can probably tell. And if you didn't already know that, I would imagine that you did. Uh, mm-hmm. So, please tell us if you think we missed anything, because we pretty much love picking these things to death. And uh, make sure that you like, subscribe, notification bell, uh, share it, do all that good stuff. And we will see you next time.